Okay, so I'm going to introduce uh, Ule, who's going to be talking about building high-performance network functions in VPP. Okay, hello. Um, my name is uh, Ole Trian. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, oh, sorry, that was the wrong meeting. I'm a coder. Uh, I want to be a coder, I guess. I'm a shit coder and a network uh, engineer. Um, so my, uh, I got so inspired by the keynote this morning with, you know, all the low and the empathy. Um, my, my wife has just been to this presentation course and she told me that I had 30 seconds to grasp the attention of the audience. So, and, and it really didn't matter what you said after that, uh, but if you didn't, you know, you missed the first 30 seconds, you could, might as well just leave the stage. Um, and you had to start with a story. Um, so my story is that I come from proprietary software in Cisco. I've been there for 20 years. Um, at least 15 of those uh, working on proprietary software made me bitter and cynical and despondent, I guess. Because uh, life there was working on, you know, with ClearCase as your favorite uh, source code management system. Um, you know, the, uh, the development environment in itself was, was good. You know, you got packets. Everything was, you know, run to completion in, with pointers everywhere. And you had full access to the packet. You could do whatever you, you wanted to do with the packets. You had data, nice data structure, structures and stuff. Um, but then you had to deal with all these platforms, which was one thing, and the interfaces to the platforms. You, you know, talk about pain with NIC drivers. You know, we could always, you know, walk over to the guy who, who wrote the, the hardware, but or designed it. But I didn't really make life much, very much easier. Uh, and then you had the other case of, you know, we had to double commit all your code fixes to 150 different branches, and you had to run lots of, you know, sanity checking on each of those. So that would take you, you know, a month of. Um, of, of uh, pleasurable work day. Um, but then I started working on VPP. So VPP is, is uh, open source, something come out of Cisco, but lots of contributors now. Um, it's on GitHub, use Git as, as the SCM, use modern tools, modern way of doing development. Um, don't have to talk to any uh, product managers uh, where, you know, in my previous despondent life, you would spend you know, seven days arguing with someone if you should write code. And now you can spend, you know, seven days writing code and very little argument. So that's, um, I'm very much in love with open source. I'm in love with VPP. But I think this way of working is incredibly much more efficient and much more fun. And if things aren't fun, uh, at least I'm built that way that then I just shy away from it. Uh, Whatever much you paid, I, I might be a first world problem, but you get very uh, reluctant to, to you know, fix bugs if it takes you, you know, two years from you wrote the code until it reaches the customer. Um, here you can fix the bug, push the button, uh, runs through you know, all the CI stuff in, in Jenkins and Garrett, and, and the code is there and available for everyone to use. So that is a lot more fun. I mean, does anyone in the room disagree with me on that? No? Anyone want to go back to the old world? I mean, we have lots of jobs there, so, you know. Um, so, purpose of this talk is to make you all into VPP developers. At least think about becoming contributors to VPP or, um, you know, if you want to do anything with packets. And, of course, you can do it on Snap as well. I mean, Snap and, and VPP are, are, you know, quite similar in their approach to life. Um, so go in a little bit more detail on, on the VPP architecture and talk a little bit about a, a VNF uh, written in, in VPP. So, uh, you know, let me just diverge a little bit with, um, I don't, you know, I might uh, provoke someone here now, but, you know, this NFV thing, um, it's clearly designed by, by someone on, you know, having retirement homes in, in south of France, which is where these guys are based. Um, it seems insanely complicated. I mean, what are they trying to achieve? Uh, so I'm, what I'm working on is somewhere sort of down here somewhere. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's some justification for this, uh, possibly. 
but yeah, I, 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 I've never figured it out. I might be, you know, I might, if someone buys me lots of beer this evening and, and you know, try to inject some clue into me why, why this is, um, is really, really necessary, um, especially when we're talking about this decomposed network where you, you make these network functions into small, small services. I mean, it is all in a data center, there's all, you know, your Apache web servers have doing a few sort of REST calls. Do they have all this malarkey around them? I hope not. Although, you know, I, I can see Charles who really wants, you know, NetConf and Yang and models, everything has to be modeling, and, you know, tools, tools upon tools upon tools. Um, so the original approach for, or the, for, for, you know, building network functions wasn't really that. It was just take, take whatever hardware appliance you have ported to an x86 platform, uh, stuff it into a VM and, and you're done. Um, and then you can sort of do the same thing and, uh, with, you know, decomposition that you take, take off all the features and put those in separate VMs and, and declare victory. Um, but what I'm trying to look at here is, is really just take that microservice, that micro function, just a few sort of um, bits of packet mangling and move that um, on its own. So that's kind of this idea of decomposition and disaggregation. Um, and you can do that with um, BPP, or you can put it on bare metal or in VM or in containers or in unikernels if you like. Um, <coughs> sort of the use cases I'm largely looking at is with service providers who need um, to ship quite a lot of traffic. Uh, so, you know, last case I'm working on now is, is sort of building a six terabit um, CGN, like large scale NAT. Um, so it doesn't really make so much sense to take that VM tax or, you know, have a virtual switch that then is going to route packets to the VMs because you just burn cores um, and not providing value. Uh, so uh, some of the models we're, we're, you know, looking at would, would typically be, you know, you could just run it on a bare metal server. Then it looks exactly like all the other products that Cisco make, right, more or less. Um, but there are some great benefits in, in in sort of the deployment model of containers and you can just re-spin a container with a new version and, and have tools to orchestrate that and deploy it. So, so perhaps this version for that particular use case makes most sense where we have a container bound directly to physical, um, physical interfaces. Um, and we're currently about, with VPP we currently have, we can build I guess a 4 for you server doing about a terabit a little bit less than a terabit per second. Um, and that's not fantastic, right? We're about a decade after hardware. So you can buy now a, a you know, one RU server with 64 uh, 100 gig ports, right? 6.4 terabit per second. Um, you know, white box programmable with P4. So, you know, where, where this is going, you know, do you want to do everything on, on general purpose CPUs or not, I don't know. I mean, one benefit of competing with this is that we, uh, we make, um, the hardware guys make their hardware a lot more programmable as well, which is cool. Um, so what's VPP? Uh, as uh, was said in, in a few earlier presentations as well, it's, it's largely a framework for building forwarding functions. Um, it can be a router if you want it to be a router. It can be a switch if you want it to be a switch, or it can be anything in between. Uh, written fully in C. Um, I think Andrew Yurchenko did a, a plugin uh, in Lua, you know, taking some ideas from the Lua guys um, in Lua Jet. So you, you could look at alternatives. It uh, scales linearly with numbers core, number of cores you put on it, runs on ARM, x86. Um, it's purely a data plane, um, so someone else should put the head on it. Um, although, you know, that boundary is a little bit hard to, to distinguish at, at some points. You know, do you put ARP inside or outside? Do you put neighbor discovery inside or outside? Where do you put your routing protocols? So you can certainly run, you know, at home I run VPP on its own uh, without the control plane, just the CLI and configuration. That's my CP. That works fine. Um, 
very integration with the Linux kernel, so you can pump packets to the Linux kernel to run you know, routing protocols, for example. We can pump over uh, tap interfaces, AF socket, um, we have our own shared memory interfaces you can use if you need high performance, or we can just send you packets over a Unix domain socket as well. Lots of tracing, logging, and counters, so it makes it quite easy to, uh, after the fact, see what happened. Um, we have full tracing of, of the you know, control plane to data plane API as well, so you can replay all the commands that the, uh, some controller gave you, so you can easy to debug. Um, you know, so VPP in a sense is an OS just without the bootloader. Uh, and I had unikernels in parentheses there. I really would like to put it on a unikernel and add that bootloader. That, that, that would make it its own OS. But it, but it has a scheduler. It has lightweight processes. Um, it is a fairly self-contained uh, user LAN application. Um, we also have a host stack with our own TCP implementation. SCTP is also, also coming. Um, and the main drivers you know, for physical hardware, they come from DPDK. Uh, we also have you know, AF packet, TAP, MEMIF. And I think you know, it would make sense to put uh, VPP on top of you know, AF XDP as well. That would, be, that would be a cool thing to have, I think. Because uh, then you could, you, know, you could split off control plane traffic before it hit VPP, for example. So you just left VPP with doing the data plane, and then you could you know, split, it, split TCP port 179 for BGP, for example, off. Uh, in a XDP and send that directly to the Linux kernel. So all that, you know, the highlights, this was more for the people downloading the slide afterwards. Um, so sort of some of the main differences in, in VPP versus Cisco iOS, which I used to work on, was in, in iOS we did scalar packet processing, which I think is what the Linux kernel does as well, which is take a single packet and run it through every feature you could imagine, you know, from Rx to Tx. And you would uh, have lots of, uh, you know, instruction cache would, you'd get lots of misses there, you'd overflow that because the number of instructions you pass on that packet would be very high. Um, so the difference here is that you take a, a, a fairly limited uh, set of instructions, run those on, on up to 256 packets, and so the first packet heats up the cache and then you run the rest more or less for free. And that also has benefits for the, for the data cache because the tables you look up, you know, you look at one particular type of table uh, for that graph node. Um, we have lots of data structures that are, are you know, designed and optimized for packet forwarding. Uh, we don't use pointers, we use indexes, so the dynamic arrays, which are very nice to program against. Um, each of these graph nodes are, are relatively independent and you could sort of assemble the graph any which way you like to achieve whatever forwarding function you want. Uh, of course there are, you know, you can't combine you know, random graph functions because that wouldn't necessarily make sense, but you can, you can add on graphs as, you know, as plugins and you can inject or program the graph uh, in, in, in quite a few places to, you know, to add new functions. Um, That's not me, I think. Um, and we have, you know, pretty much all the features you'd expect uh, from a, uh, from sort of a, a framework. We have all the tunneling mechanisms. We have E4, V6, MPLS, bridging, um, sweat, uh, segment routing. We have inbound OAM, um, IPsec, VPN, Lisp support, um, lots of monitoring stuff. A very easy and quick to, to write new functions for, for VPP. And these are all written from scratch. I mean, earlier today we had some argument about, you know, do you, how much do you want to care about your legacy, legacy code? And in, in some cases it is nice to just write things again from scratch because you, you tend to become better, you know, you, you rarely get things right for the first time you implement something and, you know, perhaps on the fourth time you implement ARP, you got it reasonably right. Um, so I, I at least, I'm not too worried about, you know, you provide a nice new and different and better programming environment and then implement things from scratch, you know, carrying things, um, 
with you, legacy things with you aren't necessarily a, a, a great thing. Um, so I think you had some of this with, uh, with Jerome, which is, I hate people doing, oh my God. Um, A few people who do these things with slides should have a, you know, they could be in the sort of edu entertainment industry or something. They don't have to be in engineering. But this kind of says it all. I mean, we, we have an RX point here. Deep decay input, for example, spins round poles, gets 256 packets in a frame, sends that to, to um, depending, you know, if it's hardware or flow, uh, hardware, um, on the Ethernet type, it will just send it directly to IP6 input, otherwise it goes to Ethernet input, and it splits off here depending on what, what the E2 type you have, and it sort of trickles through this, this graph. Checksum is already uh, done by the, by the NIC, and then it goes to V4 lookup, and you can do you know, rewrite, or you can do load balancing, in case you have you know, multiple adjacencies going to the, to the same destination in the feed. Um, so you end up, you know, with most of the, of the frame are going more or less the same path because what we've seen in, in real traffic is that, uh, you know, the, the next packet pretty much looks, uh, are quite likely to look like uh, the one you're dealing with now. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I was thinking I should show you one um, network function that, that we built on top of DPP. This is a very, very simple one. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about uh, in the, so I'm also in the ITF and we've done lots of work on, on V4 to V6 transition mechanisms. And this is one of these um, how can you make V4 live forever uh, mechanisms which tunnels uh, V4 over V6 but it, it splits the V4 address so if this is an, a service provider and it has, you know, a thousand, you can take one single V4 address and split it among a thousand customers. And each customer then gets 64 uh, ports of UDP and TCP space. No other transport protocol works. Well, if you're so stupid that you can't use V6, well, that's what you get. Um, and, well, so that's a fun thing now with, with, you know, you have all these people who refuse to move to V6 and, and they think that V4 will just continue to work the way it's always worked, but no, absolutely not. I mean, we're, we're day by day making V4 work worse, um, and you just have to learn to live with that. Uh, so we're you know, seriously thinking about, you know, one of the issues with these tunneling things, which I'm sure you guys have experienced as well, is fragmentation. And we have a draft coming up at the London ITF now in March, where, which would basically say, well, don't do fragmentation because it's, you know, it sucks. I mean, throw your fragments away anyway. So, um, which makes you learn. People learn, application developers learn very quickly. When you throw all their packets away, <coughs> then um, they sort of try something else. Uh, but, but this is ex essentially, you know, a V6 only access network. V4 packet comes in here. You look at the destination address and the port. You do an, either an algorithmic mapping or, the, or a table lookup. Figure out what the V6 destination address is. Send it here, and then this runs a traditional NAT404. Um, and the graphs nodes for that are, are represented here. So you get the Ethernet input. You do a bit more you know, V4 checking of the packet. We use the V4 lookup table to find the particular um, mapping table to use. Do the mapping, which generates a V6 packet. Do V6 rewrite and ship the packet back out again. And really, you know, looking at this as a micro function, it's, you can skip a lot of things, right? You, it, because this package just loops around. It goes into your, um, into your uh, you know, graph and comes back out again, it's, you know, the same interface, or there's no complicated routing function you need to do here. This is just a bump, bump in a wire. So this is a few hundred lines of code, 150 lines of code or something, and, uh, for a particular project we, we did, uh, I'm sure the control plane was a million lines of code, so, uh, which doesn't necessarily make too much sense. But as you see, you know, the only complexity here is what to do with fragmentation. 
because a fragmented packet, you don't see the TCP header, and you can't do routing here unless you see the A4 information. So you have to do virtual reassembly, and you have to deal with fragments. Um, let me see. So I, I thought that for fun should just show you the code. So this is, oh, this one? No. That one? No. That one? No. That one? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, so this is the main graph function. Um, I can do that. I have a Mac. I can do anything. <laughs> oh my God. Is that big enough? Yeah. yeah. Um, so here I get a frame and n left from tells me how packets there are in the frame. Then I spin through an outer loop through all those packets. Um, and I have one inner loop here where I spin through two packets at a time. Uh, so I, I, you know, it's quite simple. I have, you know, few buffer pointers, few indexes to buffers, some v4 header and v6 header information and some port, these are TCP or UDP ports. Um, and then next tells me where do I expect these packets to go next in the graph. So they go to the v6 lookup. Um, then to keep the, the memory hierarchy busy, so, so now I'm processing, in this loop I'm processing packet 0 and 1. But while I'm doing that, I'm already prefetching information and the headers for packets 2 and 3, so they're ready the next time I come around the track. Then I will set up a few pointers here to, uh, uh, to the next, uh, next frames. So these are the, uh, the two next are the frames of, in this case, IPv6 lookup. So I just assume that things are going to go well, that I, I can send this to the IP6 lookup uh, graph node. That might fail. And then I will unwind this later. Here I just get uh, the pointers from the, the buffer index. I get the headers, V4 headers for, for both of these two. I do a lookup in the... Um, in some other table I have to figure out, to get a pointer to some domain information which is specific for, um, which basically finds which V6 user this is. Um, and then I, I, I find the TCP ports, um, you know, decremented TTL, do lots of, um, um, Let's see, and then here I just do the algorithmic mapping, which is basically take U32, that's a V4 address, U16 is a TCP port. I do a little bit of bit magic or all that stuff, and I return you uh, the, the first half of, of the resulting V6 address. And then I, get, I have a, a similar function to get the V6 suffix. Um, then I just move my, my buffer pointer around, slap all that information into a v6 header, or two v6 headers, actually. So, like, so I do everything here for, for two packets at a time. And then I do a little bit of checking to see if, if uh, what I expected to happen was, was correct. And then I validate the buffer and enqueue both of those two buffers and then I go back up again. And then I have a similar loop just for, for, a, for the single packet. You know, if I got 255 packets, right, there will be one left over. And I do the same thing for that one um, as one. And that, that is essentially all the code required for that, for that you know, micro function, if you like. Right, so that's just an introduction of how you know, VPP code can look like. Code is on GitHub. Um, it's all open source. All we do go uh, into that repository. Um, 
And uh, yes, any questions? Yes. So doing two at a time, so unrolling by two. Yep. Have, is it, you, you've really just seen that that is a useful thing, the, the speculative execution. So like, that, that's a useful thing to burn into your code. Obviously, you're paying the cost. It must be a percentage, So, um, So actually, the could, current um, default. Really, could, could you repeat the question? Please? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the question is uh, that dual loop, is it you know, really worth it? Uh, you know, what gains do you see? For that, I mean, we do see um, significant gains doing dual loops. Uh, actually, to the extent that we're doing quad loops in the V4 lookup node now. Um, I, I certainly remember when the first, you know, when I got to see VPP code, I thought, "Gee, there must be a prettier way of writing this. Could there be, you know, a domain-specific language, or could you somehow make this?" less than some, um, so the guy who invented this day, Baraki, has you know, lots of Emacs skeletons to sort of give you all the outline of this. And, and I would always write a single packet loop first, and then when you optimize, you would go back and, and do the dual loop. Um, one issue is that it, it, you know, somewhat CPU specific, right? So you might not get, a quad loop might be great for, you know, the latest it does eons, it might not be the same on a different platform. So I, yeah, I, I get your point, right? It would be a lot um, an improvement if this could be a lot more flexible, and you could, you know, even dynamically adjust this, right? If you, um, or at least generate code in it in a better way. Yeah. If nothing else, thank you.